Now, there's a subject we've been talking about a little bit. Actually, there are two subjects. And we're going to talk about these two subjects one more time, and then we're going to leave the subjects for good in the book of Genesis. Well, I can't really say that because i got to, still got to talk about the flood. <laughs> but uh, we're going to leave it for a while, okay? Um, verse 6 says that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. That's the fall. That's the entry of sin into the human creation. Now, it happened because of what she could observe with her senses independent of the Word of God, without reference to the Word of God. In other words, God's Word and God's warning was disregarded. So she moved in the realm of human perception. And because she chose to make her choices based on human perception alone, independent of the Word of God and opposed to the Word of God, her husband and she brought death to themselves and to all their children, including you and me. All right, I want to say something about evolution. Remember what I told you, that we need to understand the position of a real Christian who's an evolutionist, and there are people like that, and we need to understand why they believe what they believe. We also need to understand the position of real scientists who are not evolutionists. Now, I'm not in either category. I'm not a Christian who believes in evolution, because I don't believe in evolution. And I'm not a, um, I'm not a scientist. So I happen to be your teacher today. But I'm not the kind of person whose position you need to study on other days. You need to go much deeper than I can take you. But I do want to tell you about some questions which need to be asked, because I need to warn you about the danger of considering the natural creation apart from God's Word, because that's what happened to Adam and Eve, and that's what got us all into trouble. There are some questions which need to be asked. First of all, it is clear that evolution takes place within species. Change and adaptation take place. The question is, have we evolved from the lower animals? I believe that the answer is no. I believe that, that man is a special creation. I believe that if Adam had any organic antecedents, that is, that if Adam was made from living things, then the Bible has misled us. Adam does have inorganic antecedents. He was made from the, the dust of the ground. Now, the man and the woman are created in Genesis 2. Let me ask a question about evolution. Evolution teaches that the more complex the organism, the longer it takes to evolve. The female in, of the species is more complex than the male because the female is designed to bear and nurse young. How is it possible that male and female arrive at the same moment, at the same time, in the evolutionary process, at the same place where they can procreate? How is that possible? And how is it possible in every species in which there's procreation through male and female? How is that possible? 
if it takes longer for a more complex organism to evolve. I have another question. We are told that um, the universe is of enormous age because the assumption has made that all the processes we observe have proceeded at the same rate for all of time. But if the Bible is true, that's not true because the processes would have been accelerated at creation. And they would have been different during the flood and different during the judgment at Babel and probably different during the fall. But evolutionists also tell us that the original atmosphere in which life was born into was not an atmosphere like our own. It was an atmosphere made up primarily of ammonia and nitrogen and other trace gases. Now, this has never been observed in nature. Never. It's an assumption that is made to get evolution started. It would be necessary to have an atmosphere like that to get evolution started. So you see what's happening. Debaters call this begging the question. It's when you assume your conclusion. They assume that atmosphere was there, but there's no evidence that that atmosphere was ever there. Here's the third challenge. The vast majority of mutations which have been observed in nature are negative. They are deleterious. That is, they have a, a negative impact on the organism. They're not healthy. 99% plus of all mutations which have ever been observed are negative. If evolution is true, trillions of mutations over billions of years in succession have to have been positive. How is that possible? It's not science. It's never been observed. Now, here is the accusation that evolutionists level at people like me. They say, oh, you believe in the God of the gaps. And here's what that means. If there's a gap in scientific knowledge, we Bible believers say, well, God, God is responsible for this. God does this. And then when science discovers how that's done in nature, the gap grows smaller. So our God becomes smaller. Well, I want to say that, first of all, that accusation is not true because God is responsible for everything, including all of natural law. Just because we discover how something happens in nature, that doesn't mean that God did not cause that thing to happen in nature. Just because we, we observe that matter behaves in a certain way, that doesn't tell us why it behaves in a certain way to make life possible. But I want to say that it is the theistic evolutionist who's the god of the gaps. Because when I say that we've never observed this atmosphere of mainly nitrogen and ammonia, that we've never served positive mutations in succession, what the theistic evolutionist says, the evolutionist who believes in God says, well, that's just the way God did it. Well, see, that's, that's the God of the gap argument. His theory won't work unless God bails out the theory. When the theory is proved to be impossible, then he appeals to God. There are many claims made by anti-theistic evolutionary theory which freely admit well, we know this is impossible over a short period of time, but over a long period of time, anything is possible. Yesterday I was talking to you about Professor Richard Dawkins, the biologist from Oxford who is the most famous atheist in the English-speaking world. A Russian told me yesterday that many of you maybe have never heard of him. I will just say that in the English-speaking world, he's the most famous atheist right now. And I'll, I'll say this about him, uh, he's a very good writer and he's a very hard worker. And I'll say about him what I said about the suicide bombers. He has served his master more energetically and more faithfully than I have served my master.
and I salute him for that. I don't think he's a very good thinker, and I believe that what he, what he teaches is false. But I have heard him say the words, over time, anything is possible. And basically what he's saying is that during an observable time span, we know that the things that we're claiming are impossible, but we believe that over an infinite time span, these things are impossible, these things are possible. Let me say again, that's not science, and that's not even good philosophy. That's magic, and that's faith. As a matter of fact, when you hear an evolutionary argument, many times you can substitute the word magic for time, and you'll see that there's really no difference in what they're saying. There's no difference between time and magic in an evolutionary argument. The evolutionist teaches us that we're not special, that we're accidental just like the rest of creation, and we should claim no significance. They usually make this argument because our, our star is so small, our part of the universe is so small, our planet is so small, and everything else is so big. And yet they make certain prideful assumptions about their own capacity to understand the universe that we're such a small, insignificant part of. Think for a moment about the evolution, evolution of the eye, something that's really impossible to happen unless God has His hand on the thing. But think, think, of, think of our powers of perception. If we are accidents, why should we assume that we have been given powers of perception so that we can see everything? How can we be confident that we can detect everything which exists through our accidentally developed diagnostic capacities, namely our five senses and our brain? Why should we assume that we, an accidental process of evolution, would be able to detect all other accidental processes of evolution? That's not a logical conclusion. And why should we assume that because we can't see God, that means He's not there? When I lived in Moscow, I lived in the south part of Moscow, and usually when I went to the center, I traveled by metro. But when I traveled by car or by bus, I would always pass uh, the Yuri Gagarin Square, Gagarinska Ploshad. I know I'm mispronouncing it, sorry. Which is this tall tower which reminds us Americans of the Washington Monument. It looks a little bit the same. Now, probably none of you maybe you, but probably not even you, remember April 12, 1961. I was uh, in elementary school, and that was the day that Yuri Gagarin made the three orbits around the Earth, the first man in space. And let me just tell you that that was a shock and a hard day for Americans. It put us into shock because it meant that the Soviets had won the race to space. And it was a tremendous technological and scientific and engineering victory for the Soviet Union over the West. A tremendous victory, and a victory that has to be admitted and recognized. The problem was that the Soviets were not content with a technological victory. They wanted more. They wanted an ideological victory as well. And so in the press conference where Yuri Gagarin spoke of his experiences, he made this comment. He said, when I was in orbit, I looked out the window of my spacecraft and I didn't see God anywhere. As if that was an argument <laughs> against the existence of God. Now, let me just say that's a very, very childish way to argue a very, not very grown-up way to enter the debate. C.S. Lewis, who was still alive at that time, he died in, two years later, 
writing in the Saturday Evening Post, wrote this, I would not want to worship a God who could be sneaked up on by a Russian cosmonaut. I should say Soviet cosmonaut. I think he was Ukrainian. I would not want to worship a God who could be sneaked up on by a Soviet cosmonaut. And W.A. Criswell, the pastor of First Baptist Church Dallas, who later became my own pastor, said, well, if he had taken his space helmet off, then he would have seen God. So, um, you know, just because we don't see God in certain places, that proves nothing. Aristotle, who was not a Christian, who did not believe the Bible, who probably didn't know anything about the Bible because he died in the fourth century before the birth of Christ. Aristotle said, it's impossible to prove a universal negative. In other words, you can't say God is not there. You can't say anything is not there unless you actually are God. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Let me ask you a question. I lost my wedding ring in a house in North Carolina in 1984. Let's say I search the house and I say it's not there. And let's say, say somebody else searches the house and says it is there. Who can be more sure? One who find it. That's right. You can't be sure that something is not there. But if you found it, you can be sure that it is there. It's impossible to prove a universal negative. And it's very dangerous to leave the Creator out of the discussions of the Creator, of the creation because he's the only one who knows everything about the creation because he made the creation. Now, I will say this, um, there, there, and then, we'll go, then we're going to leave it, but this is for those of you who want further study and who want to look at the real scientists. There is some exciting new work, I say new, about 15 years old, um, in an area that we call irreducible complexity. There is a scientist, a biochemist at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania called Michael Behe, B-E-H-E. -E. He's written a book called Darwin's Black Box. It is a book that has stunned and staggered evolutionists. They actually have no answer for it. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould, the most popular evolutionary writer in America, he's dead now, he died of cancer. He admitted that there was no answer for this book, but he confidently declared that there would be an answer. He said it's another evidence of the God of the gaps. We scientists can't explain this, but one day we will explain it. And the argument is that at the cellular level, there are certain components of the cell which could not have developed. They could not have evolved. They only work at that level. And the argument is they had to have been placed there and they were placed there by God. Now, I don't understand the science. I don't have the aptitude to understand the science. And I've just done a very poor job of explaining the argument. I believe the book exists in Russian. I don't know that for sure. But the name of the book is Darwin's Black Box by Michael Behe, for those of you who want to discuss, who, who want to study the thing further. One more little thing about the philosophical arguments against God, and I'll just say this and then we're going to leave it. Um, and we're talking about this at this time because the devil is making appeals against the, um, the, the Word of God based on physical observation and based on his own interpretation of, of what God has said. Two very, very dangerous things. That when we think about the Word of God, we only think about the devil's interpretation. And that when we look at creation, we don't consider what the Creator has said about it. This is the whole argument that caused them to eat the fruit.